Yes, I've got two dogs. One's Sydney, one's Tater. Tater like Tater Tot, my favorite tater salad. Um, I'm not sure if my wife came up with the idea or I. She'll probably blame it on me. Um, but I'd like to ask you guys a question. Think about something. Imagine you're an athlete. Let's say you're preparing for a state championship. Maybe you're a military member and you're performing out on the battlefield. How do you know if you're healthy? Do you do a routine checkup? How do you know if you're performing at a peak level? Do you stop all activities and do you do a blood test every five minutes? What about, let's say we have an infant. We have an infant that's in critical care. How do you know how that infant's doing? The infant's not gonna talk to you. How much blood can you really afford to draw out of that infant to do tests that you may end up doing every day, every week? You can't do much there. So, the question all of you might be asking is, okay, that's great. If someone could do it better though, don't you think they would have done it better by now? To that, I would answer, well, maybe they're not asking the right questions. Um, this equipment behind me is very complex equipment, often requires a lot of capital to invest to set up shop. These could be thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not to mention the size. I wouldn't imagine anyone walking around with this equipment, not to mention the trained staff that would be required to operate all that equipment. So, let's talk about what's enabling technology to now push us to the next level, to make things smaller, make things more convenient. So, what I have shown here is an ant holding a one square millimeter microchip. The electronics industry has been constantly pushing for smaller, better, cheaper electronics. We can use this to our advantage in both the healthcare market and athletics market. However, if we're gonna take advantage of this technology, we must, must, must stay at the forefront. If you fall behind, all of a sudden your competitors are now ahead of you. And furthermore, uh, the topic of my talk is about sweat. I'd also like to touch on that before I go any further. So the gold standard is blood. We all know blood, go to the doctor, get your blood drawn. However, it's invasive, and most people probably don't like having a needle. What about sweat? I'll touch on it a little bit more later in the presentation, but sweat's non-invasive. It has a lot of the same bio markers and health indicators that are also found in blood. Furthermore, we can make you sweat. Um, I won't go into it today, but I can make you sweat in a particular region on your body. I can also make you sweat at a particular time. We can extract that, and we can use that for a device. So, uh, that's a little caveat there. So, electronics, getting smaller. By now, I'm sure most of us have one of these, a cell phone. These were once science fiction. However, electronics is only part of the story. There's an emerging field called microfluidics. What is microfluidics? Well, microfluidics is the ability to cram very small channels inside of a very small chip. This is used for routing different fluids, let's say blood, sweat. Now, how small am I talking? I'm talking very small. I'm talking about being able to cram two to three channels side by side within the width of a human hair. Could you imagine if we took those early instruments and took all the piping and all the woodwork in there and put it into a microfluidic system? Now we require less sample, we have more control, and we get faster results. So back to the original question. How do we go from this big, clunky, expensive equipment? How do we make something small? How do we make something more cost effective? How do we package it into something that the user is comfortable wearing throughout the day? Something that'll monitor for an extended period of time. Not something you're gonna do once every hour, once every two hours. Something you put on, forget about it, and don't worry about it. Well, we started to see some technologies emerge out there recently. We've seen watches, we've seen wristbands, we've seen chest bands, we've seen earplugs, we've seen sneakers. All of these devices are nice. Um, but really the selling point there is advertising. They really don't do much more than track motion. They may detect heart rate, they may tell you how many steps you take throughout the day, but really, what do you care about? What's inside of your body? You've got blood, or even better, you've got sweat. So, the wearables technology market is an emerging market, and it's a great time to be alive because this market is really starting to take off right now. 
This year alone, it's projected that wearable technology in only the health and athletics market will reach 90 million shipments, and there's no sign of it stopping. And this is just based on those simple devices I mentioned, where they're just tracking motion. So imagine now if we can usher in uh, a new method to, to correlate back to what's really going on inside of the body. So the most popular portable diagnostic tool out there, I'm sure we're all familiar with, is diabetic test strips for people with diabetes. This is a multi-billion dollar market. So we are talking about a lot of money that reaches out to a lot of people. However, if you ask someone who uses these on a daily basis, first thing they'll tell you is it's not convenient and it can often be painful. There was a group, a company that was started several years ago that tried to look at using sweat instead of blood, so now you no longer have to prick someone. Unfortunately, the device did not take off, but this is the kind of trial and error that we need to do as a society to help us move forward. So, a little bit more about what we're doing at UC. The group I'm with is the Novel Devices Lab. We're a graduate research lab here at UC. We firmly believe that sweat is gonna be the vehicle for the future for enabling upcoming wearable technologies. The image I have shown behind me is an example of innovation that occurs not only within our research group, but, in, but uh, innovation which occurs at UC as a whole. And for the record, we don't choose sweat because it's a perfect fluid. We don't choose it because it's easy. We choose it because it's becoming increasingly evident that sweat may be the best, if not the only option for continuous non-invasive monitoring. Um, if you want to argue that with me after, feel free. We've, we've uh, looked into it a lot. So this particular image is a replica of a grad student's skin. This is not real skin. This is plastic, fake skin that has a similar tactile feel, and it also has the ability to sweat. So you're thinking, OK, well, whatever. But what a lot of people don't realize is if you're testing on skin devices, you've got to do human subjects testing. So you've got to put something on skin. That requires people, that requires paperwork, that requires a lot of money. However, if you have an artificial skin, now you no longer need that. You can now do the same tests for cents on the dollar and in half the time. So, this is my final slide, and everything I've been talking about up to here has led me to this point. I have one of the devices with me today. I realize you can't see it. It's here up on the screen. This device is about the size of your thumb. What does this device do? We put it on your skin. It can be on there for hours. It'll track electrolytes. It's very comfortable, easy to use, and it connects with your smartphone. This is really what we're striving for here at UC, and it really doesn't get too much better than this technology here. Each day and every month, we make progress in this device. We continue to push forward with looking at new biomarkers, new indicators of health, and how we can make this device here even better. So I'll conclude with one final statement. If you think that non-invasive, comfortable, cheap, easy-to-use devices are for the future, then you too believe in sweat as the fluid of the future. Thank you.